encryption just hope that you enjoyed this rare and infamous moment that combines a first-rate disaster with genuine historical significance. But now it's time to take a deep breath and get those cameras out as we prepare to temporally reset you to one of the most fantastic catastrophes in history. Are you ready? Hey everyone, and welcome back to the Time Shifters podcast, post-COVID edition for me. How's Woo! everyone doing? This is Christopher. I'm here with Tom. Happily, not, happily COVID-free for the past couple of weeks. Yeah, congratulations. <laughs> this was a, a first-time bout for me. What a what a treat that it was. It was more annoying than anything. Well, I really appreciate that you squeezed it in between recording sessions. Yeah, I did what I could. I didn't want to come on here and sound all congested and, and coughing and stuff like that and sore throat. That'd just be rude. No, rude to so our listeners. You did the right thing, and you caught it immediately after we recorded the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just about did. I was wondering if you maybe had it and transferred it somehow through the through the interwebs. Yeah, that, that, that's how that's how the inner tubes work. <laughs> Yes, but um, so yes, I've had a, a a week off to do nothing, uh, but I ended up kind of catching up and watching some television and movies and stuff. I've been watching quite a bit. Yeah. I, I gathered from from the amount of content coming out of you in between. Yes, on the social media, as I do like to post the what I've been watching, and I've been posting quite a bit. One was a uh, Blu-ray that I got as a kind of a screener copy for a new horror film that's coming out called Ghosts of Monday. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, this thing tries to be too many things all at once. It's a ghost story. It's some sort of satanic cult flick. It's a monster movie. It's kind of an end of the world movie. I mean, come up with some horror trope and it's in this film. And if it had just picked a lane maybe it would be worth watching but as it is i just found myself really annoyed by it didn't pull all the threads together like a cabin in the woods kind of movie huh no no absolutely not that's all i'll really say on that it's just it's going to be available it may actually be out now if you want to try to check it out you know you're welcome to but if you see something more in it than i did please let me know <laughs> Uh, something I did enjoy, I went and watched the uh, Man from Uncle film from a while back, the Guy Ritchie movie. Yeah. Did you Henry ever get a Cowell. chance to? Yeah. Did you ever get a chance to watch that? I did watch it. I, I I'll admit it's been so long that I can't remember a whole lot about it, but uh, I remember it was quite enjoyable. And I didn't know a whole lot of the Man from Uncle stuff from before, so. I didn't have a whole lot of basis of comparison like you do. Yeah, I haven't watched a lot of the old Man from Uncle series, but I've seen enough that I would consider myself kind of at least a fan of Robert Vaughn and David McCallum as a lead characters, and, and I and I get the sort of uh, spy fi uh, idea that they were going for. And yeah, the film I think I mean it definitely had like the Guy Ritchie touch to it, but overall I think they did a really nice job, kind of. As a, uh, well, I was going to say an update, but it kind of takes place in the same time period as the original series. So I, I, I thought it was a lot of fun. I had a good time with it. Like we were discussing prior to starting this show, uh, Henry Cavill in particular and all of his woes as Superman, the more stuff I see him in, the more, more I enjoy his, his, his style and presence. Yeah, no, I really liked him in Man from Uncle. Yeah. Yeah, is Napoleon Solo. He was great. I I would absolutely watch another Man from Uncle film with him. Someone will have to get on that immediately. <laughs> yeah, maybe this that ship has sailed. I'm afraid. Probably. Uh, something I didn't enjoy too much. I had only seen the first two films, so I thought, well, I've got this downtime. Maybe I'll go ahead and watch some of the f further adventures of the Transformers. So I watched Transformers Three: Dark of the Moon. Yeah. yeah, that was a mistake. I won't be bothering going through any more of that 
<laughs> film <laughs> series. No, I really uh, and, and bow out before you get to the next one too. Yeah, I mean this one was a lot less racist than the second film. Um, it's not really a <laughs> a bar to clear. <laughs> yeah, other than that, I kind of thought it is a uh, big waste of computer processing power. <laughs> Indeed. Shut. Shia LaBeau or Shia LaBeouf yeah. um, spends most of the film shouting his lines the same way someone might be ordered to if they were under the gun. I really didn't feel like he wanted to be there. I uh, think this was this was contract obligation film. It's exactly what it was too, because the, in the next one he's not in it anymore. Right. And honestly, uh, what's your name was supposed to be in this one, but. Um, she and uh, Bay had enough falling out that she got out of her contract, I believe. Yeah, so they brought in completely useless, uh, generic blonde woman. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, the thing that is poss- possibly most amazing in any of those films is that Shia LaBeouf managed to <laughs> to get time with any of those women. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's true. That's the most unbelievable. Yeah, you got a good point. I I I better buy all of the vehicles and all that than anything. But uh, the one you just watched also had one of those scenes that sticks out hugely for me. I believe there was a sequence where um, I I don't remember what was going on specifically in the scene. It involved uh, the military being or whatever the their little unit was. But most of the Autobots were just sitting around in their car mode parked Mm -hmm. like they were just cars. And I'm like, why? (laughs) Why anything in that film, honestly? Well, the whole Transformers series in general always treated the Transformers like they were an afterthought. they're, They're... they, they don't behave like they're supposed to be uh, individual beings. Mm. So I get the, the everybody understands the robot in disguise concept, but when they weren't in areas where they weren't going to be in disguise, they don't need to be cars. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and it doesn't even make any, it doesn't even make any sense in this world because the world knows about them. Right. Why do they need their their automobile forms at all? Yeah, because, I mean, other than some of the advantage they get out of them by being able to move quicker instead of running on legs. Yeah. Well, that's true. They don't actually fly without help in this in the film series. Yeah, unlike the cartoon, yeah, Decepticons don't just fly just for the hell of it. You have to have a flying form. Right. So, I I could have at least appreciate that part, but yeah, the, they just they always treated them like they weren't really there. Right. And that always bug bugged me. I'm like, is it a Transformers movie or not? Right. Yeah, there's there's a whole lot of crap that goes on with Shia LaBeouf's character with him getting a job and hit with his parents I'm like what movie is this <laughs> <laughs> well I mean think about it the cartoon that we all grew up with yeah there there were two humans on a regular basis and they were the side thought they <laughs> They were just yeah, there. And, and where were they? They were hanging out at the Transformer base right. doing tasks. Not, oh, 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 silly me. I tried to get a job, but I spilled coffee on the boss. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, and, and I... They weren't a sitcom. They weren't a sitcom, and, and um, there wasn't a Transformer sitting in their garage as a car waiting for them to get home at the end of the day. Right. Uh yeah, the the whole treatment of the Bumblebee character alone, like like he's like a, a pet. pet. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, no, you guys didn't get the point of any of this, did you? No. A little bit better. I finally watched Spider Man No Way Home. That is much better. <laughs> That's a lot better. I really enjoyed that. That was that was a fun film. Uh yeah, no, uh, and and is the gateway to a uh, uh, bunch of the stuff that's happening in Marvel now. Cause the stuff with Dr. Strange and breaking 
uh, the multi verse uh, apart long enough to get some uh, char- some characters right. uh, was the lead into everything that we got going on now. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I think I watched it a little bit out of order because I actually saw uh, the Doctor Strange uh, sequel before I watched this one. So I think I was a little out of order. You were a little out of order, but uh, fortunately, there's a lot of room for error between them. So. Yes, absolutely. Yes, because before this week is out, uh, I will see uh, I will see the new Ant Man movie not once but twice. <laughs> oh well, enjoy. Yeah, I started watching this series again ages ago and finally finished it. The old Birds of Prey from two thousand two. Okay. Uh, I admittedly uh, I was often fond of that, not for anything to do with the characters. <laughs> Ashley Scott is a very attractive woman. Every single one of them was a very attractive. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was kind of pulled to it because uh, Rachel Skarsken, Skarsten, excuse me, who plays the young Dinah in Birds of Prey, mm-hmm. plays um, Alice in the Batwoman series. Oh, okay. So she's like the big evil baddie, or she's sort of like the Joker. Yeah. In in the Batwoman series, but. So I was just kind of, after seeing her in that, I'd like, I need to go back and watch her when she's like, you know, supposed to be the, the, the cute, nice, young superhero girl. And it's kind of fun watching the two. They're two so very different characters. It's almost, they're the, she's the actress when you see her in the one film is, you know, young. She's probably late teen, early 20 when she did Birds of Prey. Yeah. She may have actually been a teenager. And then to see her as Alice in, in Batwoman, when you see her in Batwoman, you go, she seems familiar. Who is that? <laughs> what have I seen her in? You know, you could actually watch the shows back to back and then go, man, she seems familiar. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, uh, uh, an actor always enjoys being able to go in different directions. Yeah, it, she definitely does. So it, it's just kind of fun seeing her come back. Or, Well, now that both series are canceled. It was fun seeing her come back in the DC universe as something completely different. Yeah, no, that's pretty cool. I had no idea of myself. Yeah, but the series itself, I mean, the entire CW Arrowverse and everything has a lot to thank Birds of Prey for. Oh yeah, definitely. It really laid a lot of groundwork. It's, It's not a bad little series. It's a shame. Maybe just a little ahead of its time. Well, no, I guess there were other DC properties that were live action before that. Um, I actually recently joked with somebody because I uh, came across uh, the original opening sequence for for the old Flash series. Oh, right. And, and, and I joked with someone, I don't get what all the hype is. I don't see Michael Keaton in this at all. <laughs> No, uh, and, and fun fact, uh, as since we're, uh, I'm on that particular tangent, is the guy that played the Flash in that series mm-hmm. has played the Flash in everything but the upcoming movie. Yeah, that, very strange. Yeah, because he plays either older versions or the uh, the Jay Garrick version of Flash and all that. I mean, he even was that he was even the Jay Garrick Flash. Um, in Stargirl, from what I understand. Mm. So, that guy's been in the business for a while. but Yes, he has. But I wouldn't even call that. The Birds of Prey was definitely the precursor to the CW stuff. Oh, yeah, no, absolutely. There's a lot of um, promise in that series. I, I think maybe... Maybe a stronger showrunner, or maybe just a little bit more budget, or or maybe just a little bit more freedom or control of the properties, because there's so much they had. I feel like they had to sort of dance around because of probably rights and things like that. You know, they they couldn't do a Batman, so they would occasionally have flashbacks with Batman. It would just be this figure flailing his cape around without really being able to see who it was and that sort of thing. Because, you know, there's all this other Batman stuff going on at the same time. So yeah, they couldn't tell all the stories I think they wanted to tell, or they, they told the stories, but they used stand-ins. You know, they couldn't get a Joker or a Riddler, so they get the Taskmaster or some, you know, some wannabe. Yeah, it 
did have a little, uh, like, it had that feeling of the knockoff version uh, of DC. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was supposed to take place sometime in the future. Right. From the events that we all know, of Batman and the Joker, the Penguin, all that. They did have uh, someone that took on the mantle of Mad Hatter by actually getting the Mad Hatter's hat. So, like, okay, that's interesting, but... Yeah, it just it just felt like they were having to make too many concessions to not infringe on somebody's rights <laughs> or have to pay for somebody's for the use of some character. Clearly, I need to go back and watch this. Uh, I'm scrolling through just some information uh, as we're talking about it, and it actually lists a credit for Mark Hamill playing the Joker in two episodes. Yeah, I remember reading that, but honestly, unless it happened very early on and I've completely forgotten it already, I don't recall that happening. I, I may have to dig that up because that that would be interesting to catch just to see him actually live action Joker. I mean, he's still right. my favorite Joker. Um, but then who was it? Was it uh, Mia Sarah? Yeah, she's Harleen who, Quinzel. Yeah, and... Towards the end, she actually gets to kind of do a, you know, kind of full evil Harley Quinn thing. I think she did great. I mean, it was not the Harley Quinn that you know from, like, the animated series. She was sort of a female Joker-esque kind of character in the end. But I, she was cold and scary. I mean, I I liked her. Again, it would have been really neat to see her... Um, continue being able to be the big bad. Again, I see a lot of... You can watch this series and then watch Batwoman, and you're thinking, yeah, Batwoman is just them trying again. <laughs> kind of. And I guess they did a little better because they got three seasons out of Batwoman. Yeah, because uh, I everything about, uh, like, I was actually an avid reader of Birds of Prey at the time that this came out, and while I liked the series, I'm like, this is not Birds of Prey. <laughs> <laughs> No, it was quite off from the uh, actual telling. So, but still, it was fun, and now now you kind of have me in the mood to dig into that again. Yeah, I know it's worth kind of watching just for the uh, just for the novelty that it exists. I mean, it's only like think they think they got all of like thirteen episodes or something out of it, and and it is canon sort of because Ashley Scott did appear in the uh, Crisis on Infinite Earths crossover event on the CW. Uh, just a couple years ago. Oh wow! She she did return as Huntress. So, Birds of Prey is canon in the DC universe. That's too TV funny. universe anyway. Well, at least it's on an Earth. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Because don't know which one. Well, that was one of my big problems with it out of the gate was, uh, um, Huntress was Helena Kyle, which made her. The daughter of Batman and Catwoman. Exactly. Yep. Which was not who Helena was. No. No. Uh, from the comic book background, she was a uh, she was the daughter of like a mafia crime boss. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Who, uh, uh, who when her family was wiped out, uh, basically went on a rampage against them all. She she was actually uh, an adversary to Batman for a while because they had oh, different styles. Very interesting. Had no idea. Yeah. So she didn't come into the Bat fold as a as an ally right away. <laughs> interesting. Another sh show that I decided to watch, kind of on your recommendation. I don't know recommendation or warning. I'm not sure. Oh yeah, that was more wor warning. I know what you're about to bring up. <laughs> I checked out the Sci-Fi Channel's new series, The Ark. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> did you continue past episode one? You said you were going to. Yes, I did. I did watch episode two. Uh, it does not get any better. <laughs> yeah. I that just is, found it so insulting. It's extremely insulting. And from what I understand, it is really on the bubble of cancellation already. Weird thing is, the ratings starting out are really bad, but then they kind of get better. Like, episode one actually did pretty well on, like, um, 
you know, like the the week or two out. Yeah. So, I don't know. I, I, I read it's kind of on the bubble. It will not surprise me at all if it doesn't get a full season or only a season or something. No. It's just too... I I just... The, the universe just feels like it's just slapdash thrown together without any real thought. And it that's the most annoying part. There's these people on this arc that are being sent off to create a new colony on this world. And it's like, okay, shouldn't these be the, the, the best, the biggest and the brightest yeah. in their fields and everything. And everyone acts like they're just, Oh, I, I just work here. <laughs> you know? Well, it, it, it's even, it's even worse than that. Cause I mean, yes, that's exactly how they touted it at the beginning is these were supposed to be, the best and the brightest, the, the people that are left are all the young ones because, again, and, and I've been waiting to have this conversation with you about this anyway. Who puts all of the command and senior people into the same module um, yeah. so that it's possible to wipe out anyone that actually knows what they're doing in one fell swoop? I... That's just terrible. Um, and then you throw on there, okay, so now we're left with just the young people. And I get this is supposed to be kind of a trial fi- by fire. Uh, you have to grow grow up by the seat of your pants kind of thing. You're all in danger. But the minute they put them in danger, they all behaved like spoiled little children. Mm-hmm. Uh, what about my needs? Who is listening to my needs? I need to go take a shower. Like, yeah. That one drives me insane. That woman that took felt she could go take a shower when it's uncertain if they'll have drinking water for the next couple of days. Yeah. Well, and there's even, again, they make a big point that they've all been in hypersleep. Yeah. And so their 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 muscles have, have atrophied quite a bit. So they have to wear these pressure suits in order to walk around without falling all over themselves. Yeah. She's naked standing in a shower without any problem. Yep. <laughs> because we wanted a scene with the pretty blonde girl naked also ta- taunting the security guy who who is apparently a eunuch. Um <laughs> Because it's not just that uh, it, it's not that you wanted to see him be professional. It was he was stoically professional. Like uh, you're gonna have to go, and uh, <laughs> it it was just too cliched. Yes, everything about this was cliched. And honestly, if you're a person in your late teens, early twenties, you should be absolutely offended that this is what these writers think of you. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is definitely written by a bunch of 50-year-old men and women. Yeah, all complaining about the generation up and coming. Yes. No, it's it's really not good. And then I made the mistake, <laughs> I'll call it a mistake, of watching the coming on this season on the arc. Yeah. And they throw out all these little plot points and things that go on and like, wait a minute, the ship can travel faster than light? Yeah. Why the hell were they in hypersleep? Yeah. I, I, I saw that little preview. I'm like, what the hell is that? <laughs> yeah, none of it. It It's a shame because it actually fits in really well with our, our theme this year because it actually looks great. Oh, yeah. No, I, think, uh, I think the sets look kind of nice. The ship looks great. You know, the effects are top notch. The story, however, is just awesome. Awful. Yeah, it's garbage. I mean, we're basing it on two episodes. I understand, but yeah, but my if you God. can't capture my it, let, let, that's two episodes, but that's an entire movie. Yeah. Oh, wait, you're talking. You know the uh, the no. I want to take a shower because you know I'm special, girl. What about the uh, the lieutenant who's now the acting captain, who's interrogating the guy that they found out is a stowaway, who's faking, you know. Faking being one of the uh, necessary, yeah, one, of the te- one of the technicians. Again, yes, I'm I'm willing to put thousands of lives at risk, uh, guy. 
But she interrogates him, and he suddenly starts acting like maybe he's got something on her because he went to a bar once, and, oh, what was her name, you know? Like, are they insinuating that this woman used to be a stripper? That's their story? Right. <laughs> I mean, really? Honestly, is that really going to matter? And, and, and that's what's killing me and why you're absolutely right. And, and quite frankly, if you're a writer on this show, please come. Tell us whatever you want. Dean Devlin is behind this thing. I mean, he produced some fantastic... He produced the original Stargate. Um, didn't he actually... Didn't he produce uh, Independence Day as well? Yeah, I believe so. Um, I, you know, he's produced some really big hits. And to see this is what he comes comes up with, it's just a little disappointing. It really feels like something he thought of 30 years ago. And never got a chance to make it. And now he finally gets the chance. And so, okay, I'm going to make it. Well, do you want to update? No, no, it's good. <laughs> yeah, but I, I feel like this is an idea that he had, but then he was wronged by a young barista in a Starbucks. <laughs> and therefore, he is writing like they're all assholes. Yes. Uh, sorry, I, I, I've never been so put off by a show. And, and, and what's funny is I, I bought into the whole... Um, like sci-fi had posted you could watch the first five minutes of the show before it came out and I watched it and it, it was all the exciting sequence uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of their their sleeping chamber breaking down and falling apart and, and right. the ships getting damaged I'm like all right there, there's some adventure here I, I, I like what I see and then then they all started speaking after that scene and I'm like <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, As I said before, I may watch <laughs> a little further, but I'm going to watch it the same way you watch, like, when watch. you know two cars are going to collide. Yeah, it's watching a train wreck. How, yes. It, it, it's now a measurement of how bad. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of watching it just out of, out of spite. <laughs> yeah. Like, you want to see... It, it, it's that... Uh, and a friend of mine and I were talking about this recently. It's the show you watch to make you angry. Yeah. <laughs> like you yeah. want to watch it just so that you can complain about it more. Yeah, that's kind of how I feel about it. I really want to watch it so I can just see how stupid it gets. And, and it's funny you mentioned the ratings thing. I'm because I noticed uh, like when sci-fi posted and I actually added to contributed when they posted on um, Facebook about the, uh, the show and then they had people commenting on it after the premiere. And I threw in there that I thought this was just absolute garbage um, right on their own page. But, uh, and interestingly enough, I can't find that post anymore. Yeah. Um, but what what was funny is you mentioned that the ratings kind of went up mm -hmm. like after that first week. I really want uh, kind of feel it went up because people went out to go see how bad it was. Yeah, yeah. They 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 saw the smoke and heard the sirens, and they want to go see what exactly. it was. Exactly. It's time to go watch the train wreck firsthand, and now you'll go. All right, I saw that was terrible. I'm not going to watch that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be curious to see how it pans out over the next several weeks. Yeah, I'm done rubbernecking. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Eventually, the guy behind you is going to start beeping, and you got to move. <laughs> Time to move on. There, there's yeah. other stuff to watch. Go, go find All right. that. I re we are running a little long. The last thing I'll mention, just <laughs> real quick, because you mentioned it. I think the last time we recorded. I have been checking out Night Court on Freebie. Yes! I am, uh, like, two or three episodes into second season. Yep. <laughs> oh, my God, that show is still so freaking funny. Oh, my God, yes. It, 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 despite it, it being well into the past at this point, everything still lands. Oh, it absolutely. I mean, granted, you watch this and you think, wow, this is like an HR nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> if you put yourself in the in the place of the time, it's God, you can't you can't deny that the people 
on that screen are just some of the best at what they do. Well, yeah, and it's amazing considering as we are both of us are not into third season when it finally starts to settle out. Mm-hmm. Um, we're still talking about all of the highly transitional seasons, first and second season. People were in and out of there left and right. Yeah, I'm a little disappointed that some of the the cast from the first season didn't get a chance to continue on. I really like the uh, the original um, uh, defense attorney. Yes. I, I can't think of the actress's name, I, but I thought she was great. Her chemistry with uh, John Larroquette was fantastic. Yes, no, they, they were very good together. Yeah, so really disappointed she didn't stick around. Uh, I was okay with the court clerk. Um, yeah, no, she was fine. She unfortunately she had to take a leave of absence due to illness. I think she had like uh, Bell's palsy or something like that, and then they just she just didn't come back. Well, and I was about to say I she was okay, but I was okay with her going. Oh, oh, gotcha. Because they they jumped too hard too quickly in the whole will they won't they romance between her and the judge. Oh right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. I mean, when you do that so quickly during your first season, you don't really leave yourself anywhere to go. I, I really think that first episode is a little rough. It is, but it's charming. Well, but what, what's great is by the second episode, they literally hit the ground running. Yes. It's all there as soon as the second episode starts. And they weren't that far off the mark, I thought, on the first first uh, uh, uh it was there was some rough spots but uh, yeah but that's where we're hit on a few uh choice things like uh how he got the job in the first place <laughs> yeah, i was home i was home <laughs> i answered the phone <laughs> and, and, and for all of you youngsters out there that was a problem back then <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh now it is so much fun um selma is so much fun. She's yes. really the highlight. It's so unfortunate. I think we we lose her at the end of the second season. She passed. The actress passes away. Yes, unfortunately. Um, well, no, she's and hysterical. We, and then we get another older lady. Yes, and she then passes away. Yeah, no, that's right. the hard part. Sitting in the seat that we sit in, like we know some of the hardship that does hit the cast. Mm-hmm. So. Watching it and enjoying this show, knowing full well I'm about to get gut punched at some point. <laughs> yes, <laughs> kind kind of rough. <laughs> yeah, and I and I know they actually acknowledge that kind of stuff yeah. too. I, I remember, oh, it may not have been until like the fourth season or something like that, uh, where they have a real moment with Bull because you know he's lamenting that he, he you know he the first first Selma left, and then uh, was it Thelma? It was another, yeah. yeah name like that or whatever left and so he was really torn up about it i'm like wow all right you know to pull in the heartstrings here they were actually really good at that across the board that that i noticed like with all the actual funny funny stuff um some of the overarching storylines would just kind of hit you i assume you saw the one with uh Michael J. Fox. <laughs> yes, well, I think that's like episode three or yeah, something like that. That's like two or three. Two or three. It's uh, seeing a very young Michael J. With Fox. Santa Claus. <laughs> yes, with the, uh, it's the Santa Claus episode. And uh, and I don't know, it was it, it, it hits just right that at the end of the episode when Harry's just pulling Michael J. Fox's character in for a forced hug and all that, you just get a little welled up uh, as uh, it's playing out. I'm like, damn, this is just a sitcom. And they were doing that, like, several episodes. Before we leave this topic, I I did manage to look up real quick. Uh, It's interesting that Selma, the actress's name is Selma, and that's the name of her character in the show. Right. The follow-up bailiff is Florence. And... Ah. The, the actress is Florence Hallop, um, <laughs> and the character is Florence Kleiner. So, nice. <laughs> that's Keeping a theme. That's hysterical. I, only Roz broke it, since that's Marsha Warfield. Right, yep. 
Yeah, no, brilliant series. So much fun. Absolutely recommend. It is on freebie. Sit through the ads. It's worth it. Really just hilarious series. Yeah, my only uh, downfall with it is I have to wait to watch with my son. <laughs> oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> I just jumped in. <laughs> no, no, go for it. You're still behind us. <laughs> We've wasted many a uh, Saturday afternoon watching it. Yeah, it it was exactly what the doctor ordered last week while I was you know, on the couch not being able to do much. I could sit there and laugh my ass off. Yeah, yeah no, but best way to spend a sick day. Yeah. All right, let's end the top of the show here, and let's get in to 1996's The Phantom. comic book fans, I'm Joe Stuber, producer and host of Comic Book Central, where each and every week I welcome a legendary talent to the Comic Book Central lair to talk about bringing comic books to life. Greetings, true believers. This is Stan Lee. When do you think the Academy is going to wise up and create a special Oscar category for best cameo? I don't know. They're just asleep on their feet. Maybe your show, maybe this interview will be the turning point. Hi, this is Jamie Alexander, the Asgardian warrior Sif from Thor. I went to Marvel. They said, hey, sit down. We want to talk to you about this part. So what happened was I had a knife in my purse. I set the purse on the chair and it fell off and the knife fell out. And then they were like, oh, God, you really are Lady (laughs) Sif. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the one, the only, William Shatner. There's all these rumors out there that you're going to be in the next Star Trek film. Well, I'd like to be in it. You know, I don't want to be a gratuitous character. Like scrubbing the windows on the Enterprise or something? There's a guy on the wing. Chris Pine! There's a guy on the wing. Chris Pine says there's a guy on the wing. (laughs) Catch the very latest episodes at the website, comicbookcentral.net. Subscribe to the show on iTunes, like it on Facebook, follow it on Twitter, and be sure to join me each and every week for Comic Book Central. This is John Reese davis Hi, everyone. This is Summer Glau. Hi, this is Trisha Helfer, number six from Battlestar Galactica. Hey, this is Dean Kane, Superman from Lois and Clark, and you're listening to Comic Book Central. Where comic books come to life. Excelsior. Just take a look around. Darkness rules the Earth. In a dangerous world. Governments crumble. Chaos reigns. In a treacherous time. There is opportunity in chaos. Evil is a fact. We shall succeed where they have failed. Drax is on a quest for a supernatural power. They know far too much. And courage. Stop them. You're the only one who can. Is a phantom. Somebody I already killed. There are some who say he is only a myth. Soon they will discover the Phantom is real. The Phantom is a 1996 superhero film directed by Simon Winsor. The film stars Billy Zane as Kit Walker, a.k.a. The Phantom. Treat Williams as Xander Drax. Christy Swanson as Diana Palmer, a college flame of kits. James Remar as Drax's henchman Quill. And Catherine Zeta-Jones as Sal- Sala, the leader of a squad of air pirates. Xander Drax is on the hunt for three mystical skulls. One of gold, one of silver, and one of jade. If these skulls are united, will grant the one who possesses them unlimited power. One of Drax's henchmen, while searching for one of the skulls in the African nation in Bengala, runs afoul of a seemingly immortal protector of the jungle, the Phantom, the ghost who walks. 
During the fight with Quill, the Phantom notices Quill's tattoo of the Sang Brotherhood, an evil gang of pirates and mercenaries. Realizing that the Skulls could come under the control of the evil Sang Brotherhood, Kit travels to New York to stop Drax from gaining the magical Skulls. Now, the Phantom was created by Lee Falk in 1936 as an adventure comic strip for King Features. This character was the first superhero depicted in print wearing skin-tight costume and mask with no visible pupils, both staples of superheroes' appearances for decades after. The Phantom is a mantle that is passed down from father to son, giving the character a sort of immortality and earning him the moniker The Ghost Who Walks. He has no superpowers, he relies on strength and intelligence, as well as the myths surrounding his long lifespan. The comic has been in print continuously since 1936. Falk worked on the strip until his death in 1999, and after that it has been taken over by several artists, and at the peak the strip was seen in 583 newspapers worldwide and read by over 100 million people daily, according to King Features. I thought this was a little bit of interesting trivia there, Tom, because you might uh, get where I'm going with this. Thinking that there were already too many characters called the Phantom, including the Phantom Detective and the Phantom of the Opera, Falk considered calling his hero the Grey Ghost. Oh, However, he could not find a name he liked better and decided to stay with the Phantom. And I got chills of Batman the Animated Series when I read that. Yeah, I, I wouldn't have thought that uh, that character name had come up prior to that. Yeah, interesting. I can't help but wonder if that was because it was. It's obvious that Batman was inspired by the Phantom. Yes, no. Batman takes his cues from lots of the uh, earlier versions of uh, heroes. So the Phantom, Zorro. Yep. So I have to think that the writers of uh, the animated series. Uh, must have known this little bit of trivia and worked that into that one episode. No, that's a that's a cute little nod to where Batman may have gotten some of his uh, uh, his background. Yes, yes. Taking a few things from uh, from Wiki here, rumors of a Phantom film adaptation had first started to circulate it when director Sergio Leone expressed his interest in the property in an interview. Leone had started to write a script and scout locations for a proposed film version of the Phantom, which he planned to be f- planned to be followed by an adaptation of Lee Falk's other comic strip hero, Mandrake the Magician. Uh, the second project was also never finalized. Joe Dante was originally attached to direct the Phantom for Paramount Pictures, and he developed a draft of the script along with uh, J- Jeffrey Bohm. Dante and Bohm's script was originally tongue-in-cheek in tone, and the climax included a winged demon. When Paramount pushed the film back a year, Dante left for other commitments and eventually ended up being credited as one of the executive producers. According to Dante, I developed a script with the late Jeff Bohm, who wrote Inner Space, as a kind of spoof. We were a few weeks away from shooting on Australia when the plug was pulled over the budget in the presence of a winged demon at the climax. A year or so later, it was put back in production, Sans Demon, only nobody seemed to notice it was written to be funny, so it was dis- disastrously played straight. Many unintentionally funny moments were cut after a raucous test screening, and I foolishly refused money to take my name off the picture, so I'm credited as one of a zillion producers. Now, I find that very interesting bit of information, that he literally, it was written as a spoof and feels that what hit the screen was that bad of a misstep. Mm. Uh, I think that's one of the things that, one of the strengths of this film is the fact that, I don't even know if I'd say that people are, playing it straight but they're playing the parts they're taking the parts seriously yeah. even though they're camp yes and I, I and I do get that it's not it's not quite a parody um, but it does walk a line I suppose I mean everything's over the top everybody's performance is over the top um, yes absolutely and I think that's one of the film's charms. Well, and, and this is where the one thing I will go with on this, and and since I was a huge fan of The Shadow, mm-hmm. uh, what this is in that same 
uh, space as the shadow. Um, it feels like an old Hollywood film. It, uh, the the sets are huge. They're they're uh, everything's like overlit. Um, every everybody's performance is almost as if they're on a Broadway stage, really, really projecting, um, very much like you would have done in an old Hollywood film. So it, it has that feel. It, ha it it even feels a bit like an old serial. Um, yeah. Especially, and since it comes from a comic strip, uh, I mean, there, there there was no novelization, no radio show like The Shadow. Um, it did eventually make it into fuller length uh, comics, but it started and stayed for the most part as a strip. And that's what this feels like is each even section is like its own little adventure. Um, when you when you start the film and you get his background, that's there's there's one strip right there when you get into the whole um, uh, quill meeting quill for the first time and all that. That's its own little adventure. Um, again, because Jeff Bohm is involved and was, uh, was a writer for, uh, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, a lot of this feels a lot like an Indiana Jones film. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Rope, bridge, and L. Exactly. I mean, there, some of that stuff, uh, like, wasn't Indy falling off of that truck? <laughs> <laughs> in, in Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, literally, there are some things shot for shot. You're like, I've seen this before. <laughs> yeah, no, it definitely has that feel. There, there is definitely some familiarity yeah. uh, when you're watching this film. But I don't necessarily think that that's a bad thing because no. what you feel is a familiarity with other films that are immensely enjoyable. Sure, because I don't want to, I don't want to rain on your parade too much because <laughs> I know this is a favorite of yours. My problem with uh, with the Phantom is it, not like what a lot of people pick on. Uh, I just never felt like there's any substance to this, like. Some of it, while it's all big and over the top and, and, and it is action packed and all that, there's just a lot of it that doesn't hit quite right. Like Christy Swanson is in this and, uh, and Catherine Zeta Jones, they're your big female presence. They might as well have not even been there. I mean, they had very little dialogue, nothing move, nothing they did or said moved anything forward. Um, he could have had to have rescued anything else. Christy Swanson's character didn't want to even be rescued. I'll take care of that myself. And that was the only endearing part of her character is she was she was the powerful woman in an era where it wasn't cool to be the powerful woman, but she just didn't care, which made her the cooler. So right. you could latch onto that, but as quickly as you'd set something like that up, it was gone. Like she mm. didn't factor in to how the movie plays out almost at all. It's like the old adage: if you took Indiana Jones out of the Raiders of the All Out Dark, um, the sequence of events would still happen exactly the same. Yeah, it'd still end the same way. It'd still right. end the same way. If you take Christy Swanson out of this film, everything will still happen exactly as it did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I will definitely uh, grant you a little bit of that and. Catherine Zeta Jones is there. There's no motivation for her character at any point. Well, apparently she's uh, she's very flimsy in character. <laughs> you have no idea why she's doing what she's doing or why she decides to do something else later on. I mean, there is a there is a line about you know she's being catty and um, Christy Swanson character says we're like, what's your problem? Why are you so mean? Don't you care about anything? Like what? Well, you figure it out. I need to get that look on Catherine Zeta Jones, like, oh yeah, yeah why? And that was I'm the like, moment. Wait. <laughs> yeah, I'm like that's it. And I'm like, what the hell was that? <laughs> so maybe I do need to rethink my life. <laughs> yeah, but really? the, the, that's all I'm saying is we had some potentially good female characters, and they were completely squandered. They were pointless. Yeah, no, I would have loved to have seen Catherine Zeta Jones, Sela. I'd love to see her just be evil and stay evil. And be a, a force to be reckoned with throughout the film. Well, it, it, for that point, uh, it would have been more fun to have her proceed down that path 
than have the Xander Drax character at all. <sighs> Sorry. I don't know. I don't know if I could give up my Treat Williams as Xander Drax. Or... Now, now, granted, he, he played a, an amazing over-the-top, everything's just coming up me kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he is brilliant in this film and, and he has some of the best lines uh oh absolutely admittedly uh no I, and it's an amazing it's amazing he could spit those lines out what with chewing laughing. all the scenery like he was <laughs> right no uh and even before we started talking like there he, he does have a presence uh like like i said i'm sitting here looking at a picture of him from the film only they did it in black and white and he's looking up into the corner uh longingly and i swear to god i'm looking at vincent price so, <laughs> with the little pencil thin mustache and all that right 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 um uh, he, he he exudes something it's just he he's chewing on scenery quite a bit <laughs> oh absolutely and i think this film is better for it it really it i don't i don't think you could make this story completely seriously i think you no. have to you have to tell this story in a fun manner sure. i don't think you could do this as the brooding or the the brooding dark knight batman kind of thing no uh you it's a guy in purple tights who lives in the jungle <laughs> However, that makes sense. Sure, <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's another thing. I, I was watching this film too. You know, the character itself doesn't really work outside of the colonialism of the day. Right. No. 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 no you, not at all. Uh, like you, you almost want to see how pathetic uh, the concept of the Phantom becomes after he has kids and <laughs> after after his kids have kids. <laughs> like. Yeah, well, when when England actually gives up their control of you know Africa and India and all yeah. the you know, and all and suddenly their you know white savior isn't such a great thing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's a little bit of that too. Uh, I, I I I can appreciate a movie that just kind of jumps in on on its character and goes, "Yep, this is who he is," and get go so that we can get to as many adventures with the guy in the purple tights as possible. But I think we, we, we get like what 60 seconds of backstory at the beginning of the film, just, uh, just enough to find out where the fandom comes from in the first place. I actually really appreciate that opening because again, like we were talking about with the shadow, there is very few people who really came into this film familiar with right. the phantom right uh even though he's been in the comic strips forever right you know likely i i never saw a phantom comic strip i can't say i ever did either uh so i really appreciated the 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 whole for those who came in late <laughs> it's the opening of the film yep. and it gives you the backstory of the phantom i love that i think that's a fantastic way to kind of introduce your, your your character to a new audience. It, it was cute, but again, uh, then you start getting into some of the other stuff, like, uh, well, like Billy's character is seeing his dead father and having conversations, and you're not really clear what's happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't really know if... Uh, is he really if, there? Is he or is Kit to... Walker insane? <laughs> And he's running around the jungle in purple tights. Uh, I'm going with insanity as a possibility. Here. <laughs> I not exactly the stealthiest of looks. No, I don't know. I, I I don't know. I've never been to the African jungle, so or the Bengali jungle. I guess wherever Bengali is supposed to be, ben, Bengala. Yeah, Bengala. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know where exactly where that's supposed to be. Uh, Maybe there's lots of purple leaves. Perhaps, but but what I'm getting at with a l little more background, like okay, he's the phantom. Wait, the the phantom was born out of out of the short little story where a kid watches his father butchered by pirates. He he's left for dead uh, on the shores of of Bengala. Where he is saved by the the locals and raised as their own and 
trained somehow to to take on villainy in all of its forms of piracy specifically um mm-hmm. because it's right there in the taglines <laughs> but uh um but where the hell's the purple costume come from? <laughs> What's with all the skulls? <laughs> I like, and then when we get into the main part of the story where we're busy globe trotting to recover the skulls, what do these have to do with him since they are all over the globe? <laughs> well, they give the whole story in the film how they were, you know, the tribe was uh, destroyed and the skulls, you know, separated and sure. Sp- and lost, so. But the separation to the length in which they were separated is a little like uh, okay. However, that happened. Well, we are talking about a, a span of at least five hundred years because that's when the, the the events at the beginning of the film take place, and we see that the three skulls are united at that point. So sure, a lot can happen in five hundred years. A lot can happen in five. But I'm like. But what I'm getting at is we didn't really get a thread to pull that all through. Why, why the skulls? Why are they important to him? Why do they have anything to do with his ring? Why is he wearing a big old skull on his... He's wearing skulls all over the place. It's imprinted on his purple outfit. It, it, it's on his belt. <laughs> it's, he's wearing the ring. But we don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, it all stems from, you know, this tribe and their belief in the power of the skulls. And that's, you know, that's where it originated. And so maybe the motif carries through without really having any context as to why by the time you get up to Kit Walker's generation of the Phantom. That, that, that's as, it just becomes part of the, the mythos. That, that's, that's as fair an explanation as any. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> And, and, and knowing that, that, like, I'll defend the shadow all over the place for the same reason. <laughs> just, <laughs> I like him, and you like the Phantom. <laughs> I do, I do. You really do. <laughs> I, I just, I get such a kick out of it. I, I have fond memories of it. I, I fond memories of going and actually seeing this in the theater. I, I think saw you were this with, with us. You. <laughs> yeah. I think we had to go out of our way because we didn't see it opening weekend. We saw it like the second weekend, and it had already like left most of the theaters. Yes, because this did and not so we do had well. to, Yeah, and so we had to drive like a good 30, 40 minutes, I think, to get to a theater that was actually showing the Phantom. And then I saw the Phantom. <laughs> yes, but... <laughs> We did get our Phantom Rings. We did, yep. Which I still own. I'm sporting it right now, actually, as we speak. I love my Phantom Ring. Posted it on Facebook before we recorded. <laughs> yep, Facebook and Twitter, you'll see my Phantom Ring. I remember leaving the theater. I I enjoyed it then. I think I was the only one coming out with a smile on my face. <laughs> I think everyone else is like, well, that was a movie. <laughs> I'm I was like, happy that was to great. see Christy Swanson. But <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was fun. I enjoyed the hell out of it. And, and I will not deny that it, 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 it can be fun to watch. It's just, there are times I, I'm just going, what the hell? Uh, uh, one of my favorite what the hell moments <laughs> in the film is uh, after we've We've gone to the the secret island, the hidden island, and they they are paddling their way into the cave, and it is the most amazingly well lit cave that you have ever seen ever. I mean, the torches are burning and all that, and not a single character seems to question why that might be. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm at least relieved when, because uh, it had been so long and I had forgotten that uh, there were actually pirates living in there. So that's why right. it was all lit. But not a single character before the pirates show up even remotely questioned why there, there are fires burning. <laughs> we must not be alone. No, yeah. that never comes up. There's no, yeah, there's no, wow, it's really well lit. Or, hey, does anybody live here? Or maybe we should watch out. <laughs> None of that. None of that crosses their mind at all. <laughs> there, there are uh, quite a few moments where you 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 wonder how things work, but because it's the type of film that it is, because it's a superhero film. Sure. I mean, uh, Kit Walker's kidnapped by Xander Drax at one point. He takes him, you know, his 
Quill and his, the other couple other henchmen take him up to get him to talk or whatever, and he manages to escape. And then suddenly he's in his phantom outfit, and like, where was I, I? I could get where maybe he was hiding his costume, but where was he hiding those? freaking firearms that he wears <laughs> he's got two like 45s strapped to his <laughs> where, where were those hiding yeah well his, his his 1930s era zoot suit jacket style thing had lots of room in it <laughs> so much room that you'd think maybe he would have been frisked at some point <laughs> and they didn't notice these things well here here's the thing they take kit up up to the top he disappears and all of a sudden all of the henchmen are being bothered by the phantom. Qu- Quill doesn't even remotely go, hey, Kit, Kit's the phantom. Right. I think they even find his clothes. <laughs> right. <laughs> they do. They, they, there's a pile of clothes right there. Like, not, not a single baddie put it two and two yeah. together. Cr- nope. Christy Swanson's character got it. <laughs> well, honestly... The Phantom secret identity is when you got a voice like Billy Zane. I mean, there's no amount of uh, purple tights and masks that's going to hide the way. Wait a minute, you're the Phantom, <laughs> or just his general attitude in in the way that he carries himself too. Because there's no difference between Kit and uh, and the Phantom. I do like the, the when he tried the when he was doing. Uh, like, oh, I saw one of those, except it was green. You know, the, the Jimmy Waller or whatever his yeah. name was. The uh, the guy looking for Diane's affection. And yeah, you know, Billy, Billy Zane suddenly goes into phantom mode with his hands on his hips. Oh, that must be the Jade. I mean, where, where, where'd you see that? <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Well, yeah, and they did have that moment where uh, Diana figures out. That, I mean, she knows at that moment that... Kit or definitely suspects. Of, like, wait a minute, that seems strange. Yeah. Well, yeah, and then is confirmed when all of a sudden the the purple-clad one is running around New York. Great. I actually think some of the fight and action scenes are actually really good. Yeah. Uh, throughout the film. There's one moment... I remember the first time we saw it. I remember us watching it even on repeat on VHS and whatever and actually having to back up to watch it again when he's on board the ship and he's trying to rescue Diane. Yeah. And he, uh, he zips through the, the, like the laundry chute and he comes face to face with Sala yeah. and she's got the gun on him. His back is to her. And he kind of just slightly turns like, Oh, there's an old jungle saying you shouldn't have pointed a gun in someone. It might go off. And his hand moves so freaking fast and snaps that gun out of her hand it's almost a jump scare yeah no I, and it's done in full view in full camera like that happened that was not an edit or anything they rehearsed and did that and that is amazing yeah no uh, that I, I, full props to that that was actually a really cool moment yes i loved it that that was one of your few moments where you're like okay i get it he he has some skill <laughs> he he's not just a dude in tights running around but yeah no the, all, a lot of the action scenes and everything there is some pretty um there's some blue screen that doesn't necessarily hold sure. up the 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 airplane um rescue yeah. looks a little rough you know by today's standards um, well yeah and the clearer the screen you watch it on the uh, the worse it looks yeah wa- watching that on my 65 inch 4k screen um that plane ain't there <laughs> <laughs> well the the plane might be there but that sky isn't yeah no, uh, yeah, uh, or any of the things that are happening around it yeah right uh i think they actually did a really nice job with um uh, the stunt actors i think for the most part looked pretty close to the actors when you actually do see the stunt actors and then i think the actual actors did a lot of their own stunts as well or they're just a lot better stunt actors than i thought yeah they got there there was an well actually now i kind of wonder if it was maybe i'm misremembering uh there's the sequence early on where we see the phantom but maybe that wasn't the billy zane phantom maybe it was his father before it. There's one where the face of the guy that's being the Phantom is clearly not Billy Zane. 
Uh, no, then it, it's probably you're probably catching the the stunt man. But I, because it's all all the phantom action that we see is it's, Billy Zane's the Phantom. Yeah, that's what I thought. But yeah, then then there's a very early sequence where the while the stunt man's build and Billy's match, the faces are not close enough hmm. that uh, I totally because. Uh, Billy Zane has a very distinctive face, mask or no mask, and, and yeah, that wasn't what was coming at you. <laughs> yeah, okay, I, I I think I know the scene you're talking about, like when he's on the horse and grabbing the one guy, throwing him against the tree. Yeah, yeah. See, I I think it was close enough. I think it works. I mean, I think it was a uh, a matter of yeah, that's probably not Billy Zane, but I thought it was close enough that it actually worked for me. Well, not to mention your heart's into this. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I might, I might forgive a just a little your, bit. Your your scale for plus or minus on this one, you got a little lot, lot more room there than maybe some do. Because <laughs> so. I'm gonna challenge you. Explain to me the whole skull laser and ring thing. <laughs> Uh yeah the, the 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 end where you need the fourth skull and oh that now I understand this ring and yeah that whole thing it it's comic bookish I mean that's the kind of stuff that you know ends at the end of a of a like you said a, a serial or a comic strip or a comic book it's just that's what happens well yeah it's it's just I don't feel like they actually knew what they wanted to do with the skulls. Mm. Like they 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 built up that there's this dark power that can be gained from the skulls, and the best that they came up with in the eleventh hour is it'll shoot a laser, right? And if you have the ring, you can fight against the laser. How we don't know why we don't <laughs> know. They're supposed to work together, so I don't know why you can destroy one with the other. But whatever, you know, it's a it's a comic book movie. Yep, uh, exactly. And I do love uh, Treat William Xander Drax's sort of uh, defying gravity during that skull laser fight. Apparently that was his idea. Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. He, he talked to the effects guys, and he's like, let's let's just do this. Let's go whole hog. And so they, they worked out the wires and everything to get him so he could, like, so lean forward. So he could forward. completely lean in against nothing. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I thought that was that was pretty cool. And maybe that's what I really love about this film is that everyone really put their all into it. Whether it was putting it over the top or 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 what have you, but no one was just phoning it in. Everyone was there having a good time and and just having a just trying to make the film as much fun as they they could. Well, yeah, uh, like I said, I won't, I won't slate you that it isn't a fun film. It's just not a particularly good one. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of things I like that aren't great. <laughs> I mean, I've definitely seen a lot worse films sure. that I've enjoyed probably as much. Yeah. But <laughs> no, I've the, seen... the, this one tickles you in all the right spots. <laughs> it does. It is the one that just sort of... Uh, I. And it is not anything that I could probably really qualify. I mean, there are many other, like The Shadow, This, like you said, this isn't too dissimilar from The Shadow, mm -hmm. but I definitely hold The Shadow in lower regard than I do The Phantom. Well, and, and just like, I doubt that my misgivings about this will tarnish your love for, for The Phantom any more than yours will do mine for The Shadow. Uh, we they're they're cut from the same cloth. They just happen to hit us in just the right spots. Um, mine the shadow, you the phantom. That's it. Right, and, and that's the reason anybody likes anything. It just hits you in the right spot. Well, it apparently hits a lot of people in the right spots because, as I said, you know the comic strip is still going. You mentioned that it's been you know, put together in long form comics. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a live action television series, albeit short lived. Uh, it, he's appeared on animated adventures. There was a, was it Phantom 2246? Uh, there was a cartoon that was, you know, a phantom that took place in the future. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, no, 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 well, actually, yeah, there's like some kind of miniseries. 
so yeah it keeps popping up every now and again and i completely expect that at some point we will see another phantom film or some form or another hit the screens again well sure when everyone's done uh, butchering marvel and dc properties you gotta go somewhere <laughs> yeah. Yeah, actually, considering how hot superheroes are, it's actually a little surprising that some of these more uh, lesser knowns haven't tried again. Maybe it's too hot. Well, actually, if you think about this, and I'm going to throw that out there, is think about where these films sit, the, the, the Phantom and the Shadow. They sit there in that mid-'90s range. We had just gotten out of all of the stuff that... Uh, DC had done with Christopher Reeve's Superman, Michael Keaton's Batman, uh, the more failed versions of, uh, of Batman that followed the Joel Schum- Schumacher stuff. Um, can't even think what might have come down the pike from um, Marvel, if anything. Any movie attempts were were probably garbage out of the gate, so... Well, there was the made-for-TV Captain America movies in the 80s. Well, there's that, yeah. <laughs> well, and then uh, late late 70s, you had, like, the Spider-Man TV series. Um, yeah, right. Stuff like that. So, Superman uh, or, or superheroes had a go, but the bigger properties just weren't gaining any traction, and they went away for a while. Um which gave room for properties like this to come up. They were still in the same vein, but you didn't, they weren't as popular, so we could do anything we want. You wouldn't know any different. So I, I think that's where these fit in, and now that we're back in that surge, I think we're going to have to watch things like DC and Marvel cool off, and then you might see characters like this come back again. We shall see. Mm-hmm. We did not get a whole lot of comments on the social medias. I was expecting a little bit more from this one. I did remember to put it out there this time. Yes, you you did. Uh, We got a few things just on Facebook over there on the Facebook group. Uh, Charlie Chase says, I still enjoy it with rock on uh, (laughs) symbol there. And it said, it's Billy Zane. He's a a damn national treasure. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Justin McLean says, oof, it was hard to watch in the 90s. Can't imagine it aged well. Well, Justin, you'd be surprised, in my opinion. (laughs) Rod Barnett says, loved this film in 96 and love it more today. Billy Flynn says, it's got a charm for a bad film. It's a great double feature with The Shadow. Uh, Justin McLean pipes in. He says, Billy, I see The Phantom, The Shadow, and The Spirit as a trilogy of sorts. Uh, Stay tuned on that final film there. Joe Stuber from over there, a Comic Book Central podcast, says, love it. I had the chance to chat with Treat Williams, Christy Swanson, and James Remar about it on Comic Book Central. Yeah, some really great interviews over there. Uh, I don't know how Joe Stuber does it, but he gets some incredible interviews over on his podcast definitely want to go check uh, comic book center out at some point thanks and uh, i think we are going to have to try to get him on the show at some point because i know he's got some stories to tell (laughs) he's talked to so many people and uh, he is actually a big phantom fan so uh i'll get him on here just to help to defend my side of the case (laughs) great (laughs) double up on me hey he might like the shadow too who knows maybe but that's actually all we got from the social medias. Uh, from the more professional uh, side of things, th- th- this is the part that pains me. There was a lot of good com- feedback from critics. They, for the most part, liked it. Really? Interesting. Yeah, so La- Los Angeles Times, Kenneth Turan. Everything about The Phantom is pleasantly old-fashioned, the opposite of avant-garde and cutting-edge. Not intended for those who yearn for greatness, this unassuming adventure film is so cheerful and sweet-natured, it's difficult to resist warming up to its modest charms. On the more negative side, uh, you'll get stuff like uh, the New York Times, Lawrence Van Gelder, the pleasures are familiar but not the least bit inspired. That's as much as I got out of that. (laughs) <laughs> um, from my neck of the woods, Chris uh, Cridler of the Baltimore Sun. Sorry, Phantom, but the purple suit has got to go. 
No amount of buff bod can make an audience take a superhero in bright purple seriously. And while we're at it, that script has got to go, too. Aww. Screenwriter Jeffrey Bohm apparently studied the first two Indiana Jones movies so thoroughly so that he could write Indiana Jones and The Last Crusade that he's carried many of the motifs to the Phantom. The result is not breathtaking excitement, but rather a stunning lack of originality. So, I wish I could disagree with him. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he yeah, does he, make points. He he makes valid points. It, it, it's a derivative. Um, uh, yeah. But here's the one that's my my one of my favorites. Roger Ebert. <laughs> Gave it uh, three and a half stars, which for him is pretty solid footing. Mm -hmm. He writes... Three and a half, you said? Three and a half. Oh, wow. Yeah. Out out of his five-star rating, he got a a three and a half. So that's not bad. Um, And he writes, The purple-clad Ghost Who Walks stars in a rousing jungle adventure in one of the best-looking movies in a long time. Not really sure what Roger's watching, but okay. Um, Billy Zane stars as the Phantom. Treat Williams is the evil Xander Drax. Christy Swanson is the plucky Diana. And the stunts and special effects are nonstop. The movie is most wonderfully entertaining, red-blooded, and rousing. And with a production design that makes it uncommonly handsome. I knew I liked him. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I was really shocked by that particular review because, and and this is where where I'll side with you and why I love The Shadow, you love The Phantom, they're kind of cut, they really are cut from the same cloth. They have that same look and feel, they're all period, they're all, they have that feeling of old big Hollywood, um, which is why they're both eminently watchable, whether you like that or not. Uh, they're fun. But he liked the Phantom more than the Shadow, and it pisses me off. <laughs> Roger likes me best. Yeah. <laughs> best. That's awesome. So, yes, you won, apparently. <laughs> well, there is... A lot more films to come in the the rest of the year. (laughs) So uh, no one's keeping count, I think. You know, no one's keeping score. Really saying, audience, is you're the one that won. (laughs) That's right. You got to hear us talk about it. (laughs) Now, I did did mention this earlier. uh, While doing the research, doing a little research on the film and everything, I stumbled upon in 1961, they attempted to make a... uh, they they made a television pilot for the Phantom. Oh, really? And it's pretty unremarkable, <laughs> except that for the pairing of Lon Chaney Jr. and Richard Keel appear. Oh, wow! And that's pretty freaking awesome. Uh, I did post that to the social media, to the Facebook group, and to Twitter, and I we. Time Shifters does have a YouTube channel, and I have posted it there. I actually was able to get it and clean it up a little bit. The The print that I found was really washed out, and I was able to throw a little contrast in there just so you could actually see it a little bit better. And I went ahead and uploaded it to our YouTube channel so you could watch it. It's about 25 minutes long or something. It Yeah, it's not great. The Phantom uh, is black and white for one thing, so... You don't get the purple tights, but the Phantom was, is played by a, a, a stunt man, and I swear the stunt man's got a bit of a pot belly. So, because <laughs> that's a good look in a tight purple outfit. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, but just for the kind of uh, historical significance, you know, it, it's it's worth twenty five minutes of your time. And again, because you also get to see you know Lon Chaney Jr. And Richard Keel is kind of like your big bads. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it's a young Richard Keel. I'm, I kept listening hearing his voice. I'm like, that sounds a lot like Richard Keel. <laughs> so I had to start to dig it up and look at the credits, and son of a gun, it was. Oh, see, I was going to make the joke. Uh, I could totally picture Richard Keel as uh, the Phantom. <laughs> <laughs> 
I don't know. I don't think you'd be able to hide that identity. <laughs> no. No, afraid not. <clears throat> well, occasionally he could. Uh, since he's wandering around in the jungle, he could break out a little ego. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, again, just more proof that you know the Phantom uh, does. It does. He does seem to be immortal. He just keeps popping up. Uh, even though you know one thing fails or you know something dies, he, he he shows back up later. So very fitting, and all that says to me is we'll never be rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> well, next episode we are going to stay in the superhero theme. You can't uh, make me. Uh, <laughs> through no machinations other than just kind of random luck. We're falling on 1997's Batman and Robin. Ow. <laughs> Directed by Joe Schumacher, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger, George Clooney, Chris O'Donnell, Uma Thurman, Alicia Silvertone, and Michael Goff. Yeah. Um, this is gonna I hurt. think I think I've not seen this since it first came to home video. I definitely didn't see it in the theater. I think I came it when it first came to like VHS. So, this will be the first time I've seen it in quite a long time. Uh, I did watch it in the theater, and I really wanted my money back so badly. (laughs) (laughs) I'll admit, back in the day, Alicia Silverstone would have been enough to draw me in. Yeah, right up until you find out what they did with her. (laughs) Uh, Well, yeah. At any rate, (laughs) yeah, this will be a long, hard slog for us. Yeah, this will be interesting. And we'll find out, A, if there's anything really to it, and B, did it really look pretty? Does it really fit our theme? Yeah, right. <laughs> well, and, it, I'm sorry. The, the, this just this is the kind of movie uh, the Mads would send up to the Satellite of Love. <laughs> <laughs> it's just so bad. Anyway, we will have a lot of fun reviewing that. <laughs> Yeah, we're definitely, as far as the Batman franchise through the 90s, we are definitely jumping in the deep end on this one, I think. It is the one that killed Batman for a good... Uh, when, when did the when did uh, the next <laughs> ones come out? I think it was at least a good decade or more. Uh, well over a decade. Yeah, so we will be checking that out in a couple weeks. Uh, until then, I guess that's going to be it. Tom, thanks very much for putting up with The Phantom. Ah, it's still fun to watch, but it's even more fun to pick on you. (laughs) (laughs) As I play with my phantom ring and look at my phantom action hero, which you bought me. (laughs) I know. uh, I'm feeding the beast. (laughs) That's right. Excellent. Well, we will talk to everybody in a couple weeks. Uh, Thanks very much for listening. Any feedback or anything, please send it our way, timeshifterspodcast at gmail.com, or follow the link in the show notes to all the social media platforms. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See ya.